Welcome back to another episode of What's Next? Living Longer, Better, Smarter. This time out, interest and involvement, the elections and older adults. We have a Hall of Fame lineup for you. This edition is made possible by AARP, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that empowers people to choose how they live as they age. Learn more at aarp.org. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Mary Furlong. Hi, Mary. Hi, Fred. We really have two amazing people with us today, and I know we can learn a lot from them. We sure do. From AARP Executive Vice President and Chief Advocacy and Engagement Officer, Nancy Lamond. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Fred. Thanks for having me. And we also have with us former U.S. Senator from New Jersey, NBA New York Nick Hall of Famer, author, broadcaster, and so much more, Bill Bradley. Hi, Bill. Hey, Fred. Hey, Mary. How you doing? Really great. Um, this really is a Hall of Fame lineup. Thank you so much for being on the podcast with us. And Bill, it's wonderful to see you. We have a bit of history together. You were a backer of Third Age Media. And we even put a basketball court in your office and you wrote for our website. So we were really a supporter. We even went to New Hampshire with to support you. So time flies. And that's the ultimate commitment. <laughs> it was. It was. <laughs> it was and, fun, too. And in my career as a journalist for WCBS Radio in New York, I had the pleasure of covering your political career after having been a fan when you played for the Knicks and Princeton University. So great to see you, Bill. Great to see you too, Fred. Really appreciate the chance to spend a few minutes with you. Well, we're going to want to chat about the documentary all right. uh, about all you have done rolling along, which is on Max, uh, which I highly recommend. First, we're going to turn it for a little bit to Nancy and the upcoming elections. Tell us, Nancy, about the, the power of the older voter and how you expect this group to show up come November. Well, thanks very much. And uh, Senator, I was one of your constituents. I grew up in uh, Milburn, New Jersey. So it's great to, great. Uh, great nice to town. see you. It is a nice town. Um, well, back to the question. First and foremost, we know that older voters will show up in big numbers. I call older voters the deciders because election after election, they make up the majority of the electorate. There are around 115 million Americans over the age of 50, and that's 45% of the voting population in the US. But according to exit polls, they cast 52% of all ballots in 2020 and 59% in 2022. And, and it's not simply because there are a lot of older folks. Uh, they turn out at a much higher rate than younger voters, even in high turnout, presidential years. In 2020, close to three quarters of voters over 50 turned out compared to a little more than half of under 30-year-old Americans. And in 2022, more than six of 10 of the 50 plus turned out compared to just three in 10 of folks over 30. Um, in addition, we're paying particular attention to older women voters. They are a big group that is fairly evenly divided by party and they show up at the polls. Women 50 plus cast one third of ballots in 2022, 25% of the voting age population, 28% of registered voters. And we do a lot of polling. And in our latest She's the Difference survey showed that women over 50 evenly split on the generic congressional ballot favoring President Biden very slightly over President, uh, former President Trump. Uh, men over 50 overall lean more Republican. And in 2022, there was a big swing among women over the age of 65 in the battleground congressional districts. Uh, it turned a potential red wave into more of a red trickle. And our polling showed that voters age 65 and older shifted from favoring Republicans by 10 points in July to favoring Democrats by three points in November. Big shift. And women over 65 were the biggest movers. They went from 46% Republican, 44% um, in July, to 55% Democratic, and then 41% in November, a 16-point swing. Um, and then quickly, their top issues were the threats to democracy and Social Security and Medicare. 
And Nancy, say a little more about those issues. And is caregiving an issue? Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, in our recent national survey, we asked what people thought was the biggest issue in the country. And the top three for voters 50 plus were the cost of living, immigration, and threats to democracy. And one thing we know is that part of the issue with cost of living is also the investment people are having to make in, to, in their family caregiving activities. We also know that when it comes to their voting decisions, <coughs> excuse me, Social Security and Medicare are very important, particularly for voters over 65. And an overwhelming majority of older voters say that elected officials should do more to help aging Americans stay in their own homes and support family caregivers. Um, in a congressional battleground survey we did, Social Security and Medicare was at the top. And our She's the Different survey, um, it showed that overwhelmingly women voters were very concerned about being able to keep their loved ones in their own home. So we're seeing um, Social Security, Medicare, caregiving at the top of the agenda. Very interesting. Bill, I know you are very involved in legislative efforts sur surrounding the preservation of Social Security when you were in office. Uh, well, yes, I was there when we um, did the big Social Security compromise in the 80s, the bipartisan uh, compromise that actually uh, saved a trust fund and guaranteed Social Security over the mid to long term. And um, it was always uh, an important issue. And I found that it wasn't just an important issue for elderly Americans. I, I feel a lot of their children have a sense of what's just and what's fair. And they believe after you live a whole life and you raise the kids and so forth, or, or you have three jobs, you, you deserve to have a dignified retirement and have a little money from the government in Social Security and in Medicare. Now, uh, Bill, you were in the Senate from 79, 19, 1979. Yeah, back in the Paleolithic era, Fred. <laughs> Until January 1997. And in this documentary that's out that we referred to earlier, Rolling Along, you really take yeah. us on a journey through all that came before and all that has happened since. And there are so many lessons here, I think, to be learned. Here's Bill Bradley. Everybody's All-America Choice. Bill hails from Crystal City, Missouri, and he now owns every Princeton and Ivy League scoring record. You begin by bouncing a ball. Your knees are bent, your elbows under the ball. You shoot and you follow through. I couldn't get enough. My father always wanted me to be a gentleman. My mother always wanted me to be a success. And neither one wanted me to be a basketball player or a politician. Number 24, Bill Bradley. The crowd turned on me. You gotta feel sorry for any rookie that's gotta come into this league and play against these great ones. Now I had to do is to prove myself to my teammates. Good rebounds and he's Bradley, good. Beautiful teamwork. The new NBA champion. Standing at center court, knowing you're the best in the world. It lasted about 48 hours. Uh, one of the things I think you talked about was working in Washington, perhaps, for the government. What about that? Uh, at some time in my life, perhaps, uh, uh, I would like to work for the government. I chose politics because I saw how government made millions of lives better. I wanted to know America like I once knew the seams of a basketball. I challenged Al Gore for the Democratic nomination. I know it would be tough, but as the button in our campaign said, Bradley, he's hit the long shots before. The beautiful paradox of America is that we are many, that we are individual, that we are different, but that we are one. Tell us how the documentary came about. That's an interesting story. Yeah, uh, well, I gave my political papers to Princeton. Uh, they did oral history, interviewed about 50 people. I invited all 50 to a reception. 40 showed up. I stood up and told stories about each one of the 40. One of them was a friend of mine who's uh, produced 72 plays on Broadway, and he came up to me afterward and said, sounds a little bit like Hal Holbrook. You ought to work something up doing Mark Twain. And so I thought, yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> 
for the next year, I wrote it, and then I took it on the road to workshop it, and um, then ultimately decided COVID came, and it was impossible to go into theaters, so I, I just kept working on it. And it, it ended up that I did it four nights in the theater in New York, and we had five cameras and filmed it, and the result is rolling along. And uh, it's uh, really a, a film um, about a lot of things, um, but I, we did a focus group after we had the film made and asked the 15 people, actually it was 50, narrowed to 15 for the focus group, um, you know, balanced by every kind of diversity you can have. Uh, what did you think this film was about? And they said, well, we thought it was about um, uh, love of country, uh, love of the game. It was about perseverance and forgiveness and triumph and loss and sadness and joy. In other words, it was about life. And so I thought to myself, well, I'll take that. <laughs> because that's indeed what I had hoped it would be. I was, I'm extremely candid in the film. And I'm, I, the reason I do that is uh, I hope that it can get people to think about their own stories and tell their own stories. And out of that will come an appreciation for our common humanity and hopefully a little healing in a country that is deeply divided politically, uh, but not on a human level. Uh, so I, the key thing is that's what was my hope and that's how it happened and so forth. That, that's what I took away. So you made some intriguing decisions along the way in your life, changing your mind about which university you would go to, switching from Duke to Princeton, delaying a pro basketball career to go to Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar, joining the Air Force Reserve before graduation, and then leaving pro basketball for politics at the age of 33. What led you to make some of those unexpected decisions? Well, to me, they were fully expected. <laughs> I, they were a natural evolution from one interest to another interest, one challenge to another challenge. And um, I, uh, I I loved the game of basketball. Um, but, you know, when I finished college, I wanted to continue my education. So I passed the pros and then came back and played. And for 10 years, I was with the Knicks. We won two championships. And um, it was a special group of human beings. And the thing that should be celebrated was the group of human beings that I was with um, who uh, were selfless and had great imagination and discipline. And that was a great experience. And then uh, toward the end of my career, I decided, well, my, my interest in basketball was de decreasing and my interest in politics was increasing. So I thought, well, you know, why not run for the office I really want? You know, the idea was, well, you run for Congress a couple of years and then you maybe run for the Senate. I said, well, I really want to be a senator. So I ran for that right off the bat in 1978 and with some luck and a lot of support from uh, friends and family and uh, general supporters. I was elected, served 18 years and the greatest honor of my life, represent New Jersey for 18 years in the Senate. And um, it was the people that was the key to me, as I think you'll see in the course of watching Rolling Along, it's always the people and all of their diversity and sadness and joy. And um, so I, I, uh, I, I think back to all those decisions and they seem natural to me now, but at the time they were not. I was taking a leap, you know? I didn't know, was I gonna come back I can play basketball when I went to Oxford. Everybody said, well, you gave up your chance to play pro ball. And I said, well, I don't know. I played in Italy for a year. I kind of I did a radio show out of England back to KMOX radio in St. Louis. I interviewed Mary Quant and Lord Harlick, who was J JFK's buddy. And um, so I had a, had a w wonderful experience. And then I thought, well, now's the time. I'd like to play. And it turned out okay. Interesting. You know, you used to, uh, pe people today, politicians do these town halls all the time. I remember covering you as you walk the coast of New Jersey every year, You the shore on the, on the board, yeah. walk, the beaches. And it was, it was a great thing that people would come up and talk to you and tell you what was on their mind. Really terrific um, thing. I talk about that a little bit in the film. 
And um, it was true. I mean, you know, the town meeting, I did plenty of town meetings, you know, go to the firehouse or the city hall and sit and 50 people come or 100 people or 300 people and they ask you questions. But when you walk along the Jersey Shore, I, you know, I'm walking on the beach in my shorts and T-shirt or short sleeve shirt and or along the water's edge and people would run up and ask questions and uh, or they would tell me stories and that's uh, where I've always loved stories, and that's what I tried to reflect in rolling along. Back back to uh, present day politics, uh, Bill. I'd love to hear from you and Nancy both, really, about the impact of older voters. They were certainly, Bill, an, uh, a, a force in New Jersey when, when you were running. Um, of course they were. I think that the key thing is you show respect to all voters, and in particular, you show respect to older voters because they have the benefit of years of experience. And this year, I think, as you said, Nancy, they, they, they will be very, very important. This is an existential moment in our country's history. And um, it's, as I say in the show, it's more about our common humanity than it is about uh, R&D. And uh, we, we have a very, very uh, serious challenge ahead of us and a real choice for the American people. And I say to a lot of my Republican friends, and they agree, look, we, we just can't understand another four years of, of Donald Trump. It, it's, it's gonna be beyond imagination as to what might happen. And so uh, they step up. I mean, Lynn Cheney stepped up, for example. A lot of Republicans I know aren't gonna pull the lever for him, but the key thing is they're older voters, uh, by and large, older voters are a little more conservative. They're a little more value-based. They also have the experience of having a lot of people talk at them over time and deciding who's real and who's not. And and so I, I think Joe Biden will fare very well um, with older voters. I'm hoping that anyway. And um, there are plenty of things that have to get done. And I believe that he, you know, I, he was a senator, right? Uh, he wasn't living in a palatial skyscraper in New York City. He he was a senator. He was taking a train every day from uh, Washington to Delaware. He did town meetings. He listened to people complain about Medicare, Medicaid, or whatever, or, or Social Security. And he formed his view of why they are noble people. And I believe he thinks that. And that, I think, ultimately will come through. And we just want to point out for, for the audience here that obviously Senator Bradley is not a nonpartisan. He can't be, right? <laughs> having having been in office and run for office while the AARP is a, a nonpartisan. Yeah, yeah, of course. This is not AARP's comments. These are my comments. <laughs> so. so, Nancy, tell us how AARP is working to make sure that voters and the issues they care about are addressed by the candidates that are running. You're doing a lot of voter education, correct? Well, we are, and um, in fact, though, though we are nonpartisan, we are very focused during every election cycle to focusing candidates on the issues important to older voters, and then in turn, letting our uh, constituency, our members know where the candidates stand. And one of our big initiatives this cycle is asking every candidate for federal office what he or she will do to protect social security and support family caregivers. We started this in the early primary states, Iowa, New Hampshire, Nevada, and South Carolina. Obviously, that was uh, focusing on the GOP candidates. And we were able to get all the major candidates for, for president on record talking about these issues so that we could share it with our members and our broader constituency on AARP.org. And now, as we speak, our staff and volunteers across the country are actively reaching out and talking to candidates, incumbent members of Congress and senators, as well as as well as challengers. Nancy, with, with voting laws uh, sometimes changing, how is AARP uh, working, fighting to to ensure that everyone knows when, where, how to vote? You've got offices, I know, at the state level. We do. We have offices uh, in every state: uh, District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And as you suggest, uh, Fred, this has been a big focus for us. And frankly, it started in 2020 during the pandemic when there were so many changes uh, about where to vote, how to vote, when to vote. 
Um, we know our constituency will turn out to vote. But as you notice, rules keep changing. And so we work very hard to be sure they have the information they need to cast ballots safely and with confidence. Our state election guides on AARP.org have information on things like deadlines, ID requirements, and are continuously updated to reflect the latest changes. And, and also are continually updated as there are mis as misinformation is delivered across various uh, uh, airwaves. Uh, we also have articles in the AARP bulletin leading up to the state primaries and the general election, highlighting the key issues and things we think folks should know. And we do teletown halls and webinars with state and local election officials. And in fact, we're able to do these very quickly if in fact there's a wave of reporting that is inaccurate. We're able to kind of get the Secretary of State on the, on the phone, on one of these teletown halls to clarify uh, what, what people need to know in order to vote. And then on the advocacy side, we keep a close eye on legislation and regulations and fight to protect older adults' ability to exercise their right to vote. Right now, our state teams are tracking cumbersome voter ID requirements in a number of places, particularly any that require voters to place copies of their identifying information in the mail, which creates a privacy concern. We're also monitoring proposals to limit mail ballot access, including those with unnecessary notarization requirements. And these kinds of proposals are essentially burdensome for voters with mobility issues, disabilities, and those in nursing homes or other residential care settings. So we're active in uh, any, any, any year divisible by two, uh, we're out there. And Nancy, I can't tell you how important that is because the way you uh, stop democracy is you make it more difficult for people to vote, change rules, do all the things. Uh, AARP is a, such a trusted voice uh, to get that information to your members in time for voting is just really an important public service. Oh, well, thank you. It's wonderful and, and quite an army of volunteers you have. Yeah. Um, and I think, Nancy, your state directors have a big pulse on the issues they're hearing at the state level too, correct? Oh, absolutely. Um, not only our state directors, but our volunteers. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm sure Senator Bradley more often than not ran into our volunteers on the beach and, uh, and, in, and in town halls. And they're really our lifeblood. They are everywhere. And to your point, we, um, uh, we get such good insights from them. I, I'll give you one quick example. During COVID, about a, about a month after we had the, in effect, the shutdown, uh, we did a series of regional meetings with our state directors and our state volunteer leaders. And at the end of each call, I said, what are you seeing out there that we may not realize here in Washington? Every single one of them talked about food insecurity. They talked mm -hmm. about seeing older Americans in lines at, at uh, food banks. And we were able to move on our advocacy on SNAP and other food programs well before it was reported in the national news, well before it was a topic um, in polls that were being taken. It really told me and showed me how our volunteers have a pulse on what's happening in communities across the country. Yeah, I see a theme here of listening to those stories. Um, uh, that was a, a lesson you taught me, Senator Bradley, <laughs> over lunch one day. You said, always tell a story because people will remember those stories. And I went to a fundraiser Saturday night for housing insecurity in Oakland and just saw the rising number of older adults that are housing insecure. So it's getting that handle on the pulse. So, um, Bill, maybe you can stir some memories of how things were, working across the aisle to get things done in Washington, and what you hope, what are your hopes for restoring some of that ability to get things done? Well, I'm I'm of the view that we're uh, we're kind of in, in a in a storm, right? And it will pass. Can't be certain, and it can be very destructive if it doesn't pass. But I think it'll pass, and then people will reassert, as I said earlier, what I try to do in rolling along our common humanity. And in my case, uh, let's just take the largest legislative accomplishment that I uh, had, which was 
the Tax Reform Act of 1986 to cut tax rates from 50 to 28 percent and eliminated a lot of loopholes to pay for the revenue that was lost. Um, that was um, a, a policy that I advocated for four years, right? It was a policy that was adopted by Ronald Reagan. And it was a policy that passed the Senate like 97 to 3. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but overwhelmingly passed the Senate. And it became the law of the land. And it was a it was a bipartisan joint effort because there was something in it for Democrats, there was something in it for Republicans. And the result was that there was a commitment to it that was very deep and in that time, you know, but taxes, you know, you're only good for a Congress or two, and then somebody's going to either want to cut more taxes or put more loopholes back in. But that was a moment that was enormously important to me. I mean, I'm still friendly with a lot of the people. Alan Simpson, who was a colleague of mine, a Republican, was actually the whip. I mean, we're, we see each other several times a year. I'm in direct contact. Just got an email yesterday from Bob Packwood, yeah. who was the chairman of the Finance Committee at the time we did tax reform, who was telling me about uh, some crazy when he was running and how the person used to disrupt his town meetings. And so, I mean, the, the people become friends. And that's what people don't understand about the Senate. If you divide it R and D, then you're eliminating what is shared by R's and D's, right? <laughs> and it's our common humanity. And that's what ennobles us. And that's what allows compromise. And the more you keep that in mind, uh, the more effective you're going to be. And you have to decide if you're going to be in the United States Senate, do you want to be effective or, or do you want to uh, posture? If you want to be effective, then you got to listen. I always say ears are more important than mouths. Uh, when it comes to legislating. And you do have to listen to what your uh, colleague wants and then try to find a way. That doesn't mean you're going to agree on everything. That means there are often stark divisions. But it doesn't mean you can't uh, create a, an atmosphere of collegiality, literally, where you listen to other people and, and you know what? And learn. You know, maybe you learn. You know, just because you were elected by your state doesn't mean you know everything about everything. For example, when I was elected from New Jersey, I knew nothing really about the Western United States. But I suddenly found myself as chairman of Water and Power, which was in charge of water, all the federal water in 20 Western states. So I had to learn about the West. And, you know, you have to approach these things sometimes with a little humility. And, and then you end up listening and learning. And to me, that's the excitement in whatever you do whether you're trying to write a film or whether you're trying to pass a law or, or whether you're trying to make an investment. It makes me want to reread values of the game. Um, well, I'd love to keep you're talking sure, to Mary, you both. Sure. <laughs> I will. I will. We gave a copy of that to all of our uh, team uh, the, during the time. I'd love to keep talking to you both all day, uh, but we have to respect your schedules and the important work you do. So Bill and Nancy, Thank you for spending time with us on our podcast today. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be with both of you and see both of you again. And let's not wait so long for having that happen again. I know you're not on your show, but whatever. Well, we do have an event at the National Press Club. We should invite you to be part of that, too. So, uh, Okay. Uh, Nancy, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Great to be here. And we urge everyone to watch the documentary rolling along. It's on Max time very well spent. Find more at billbradley.com. We want to thank AARP for helping to make this episode possible. AARP, empowering people to choose how they live as they age. Learn more at aarp.org. And check out the latest edition of the AARP Bulletin. Nancy is quoted in there, too, talking about elections. Mary, this has been an exciting spring. You had a great Longevity Venture Summit. Tell us about some of the highlights. Well, two stories. One was a quote about uh, where AI is today. Um, if you looked at AI five years ago, that's where caregiving is today. So caregiving is going to be one of the very big issues. And the second is, this was a quote by John Hagel, 
we should have a wellness coach. We should all strive to have a wellness coach and let data inform the metrics. So we have the aspiration of leading a very healthy life. And there's a lot of innovation and technologies that will do that. We saw so many companies really changing new technologies that can enhance chronic conditions, can help with mobility. It's a very exciting time um, to see this innovation. And there's more coming up uh, this December, Mary, in Washington, D.C., the Longevity Innovation Summit at the National Press Club. That's scheduled, I think, for December 9th and 10th. The website for more info on that is WashingtonInnovationSummit.com. Thanks to our guests once again, and thanks to all of you for watching or listening. It is appreciated. You can always find us at MaryFurlong.com slash podcasts.